This podcast is a conscious effort to fight the impending darkness that surrounds us by filling that void with light. Here we focus on truths that surround us, whether found in myth, ancient texts, scripture, literature, basically voices from the past and present. Together we will find the traces, pull the threads, and follow the sparks along the way. Welcome to Reflecting Light, and here is your host, Mandy Green. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Reflecting Light. I'm actually recording this in the fourth watch of the night because that is the topic of our podcast today. So if I sound a little croaky, that's why. Morning is not usually my thing. But I wanted to intentionally because with all of the things we could talk about with Easter, What's really struck me this week is that time of darkness between the crucifixion and the resurrection and what it must have felt like to sit in the dark and to wait and to watch and to maintain the faith in the face of all of this evidence that would say something is irrevocably lost. So let's dive in. In the Ellicott's commentary for English readers on Matthew 14, 25, which is an instance where the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee, they're about three quarters of the way across. It's the fourth watch of the night, and the Savior comes to them walking on the water. His commentary says the Jews, since their conquest by Pompeius, had adopted the Roman division of the night into four watches. And this was accordingly between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the dimness of the early dawn. And that's when Mary is at the tomb waiting for her Lord. It's dark sometime between these hours, and we're in the fourth watch of the night. Now, do you sometimes feel like you are permanently in the fourth watch of the night? I know there's definitely times of darkness where it just feels like that. I think this life in and of itself is a fourth watch of the night. Well, it's the whole watch of the night, but particularly in that fourth watch when things have drug on all night and it seems really long and you're waiting for that sun to rise. What do you do? How do you hang on? I wanted to read a bit from the an apocryphal work called The Book of Adam and Eve. I like the translation by R.H. Charles. And I really, really recommend it. It's called Pseudepigrapha, meaning it's attributed to be written by Adam, but there's no proof that it actually is Adam. But it's really such an eye-opening account of some of the things they might have suffered when they leave the garden and how mortality and darkness and hunger and thirst and death are all introduced and how devastating it is for them. Can you imagine being in the presence of God and being able to remember that and then having to live without that? And so I wanted to read from you when darkness first, when they first become acquainted with darkness and what the gods say after that. Let's start with chapter 11, verse 4. When in it Adam could not see Eve, he only heard the noise she made. Neither could she see Adam, but heard the noise he made. Then Adam wept in deep affliction and smote upon his breast. And he arose and said to Eve, Where art thou? And she said unto him, Lo, I am standing in this darkness. He then said to her, Remember the bright nature in which we lived while we abode in the garden? Oh, Eve, remember the glory that rested on us in the garden? Oh, Eve, remember the trees that overshadowed us in the garden while we moved among them? Oh, Eve, remember that while we were in the garden, we knew neither night nor day. Think of the tree of life from which flowed the water and that shed luster over us. Remember, O Eve, the garden land and the brightness thereof. Think, O think of that garden in which was no darkness while we dwelt therein. 
whereas no sooner did we come into this cave of treasures than darkness compassed us round about until we can no longer see each other. Think of that on a deeper level, by the way. And all the pleasure of this life has come to an end. And they continued to mourn and weep in this dark state, not knowing that light will return, thinking that they're doomed to this dark state forever. And the Lord comes and says, I'm going to teach you something about night and day. And in chapter 14, we have the earliest prophecy of the coming of Christ. I'm reading from the text saying that. Then Adam said unto God, O Lord, take my soul, and let me not see this gloom any more, or remove me to some place where there is no darkness. But the Lord said to Adam, Verily I say unto thee, This darkness will pass from thee. Every day I have determined for thee until the fulfillment of my covenant when I will save thee and bring thee back again into the garden. Notice the garden imagery. Notice the resurrection takes place in a garden as well. Into the abode of light thou longest for, wherein is no darkness. I will bring thee to it in the kingdom of heaven. Again said God unto Adam, All this misery thou hast been made to take upon thee because of thy transgression will not free thee from the hand of Satan and will not save thee, but I will. When I shall come down from heaven and shall become flesh of thy seed and take upon me the infirmity from which thou sufferest, then the darkness that came upon thee in this cave shall come upon me in the grave when I am in the flesh of thy seed. And I, who am without years, shall be subject to the reckoning of years, of times, of months, and of days. And I shall be reckoned as one of the sons of men in order to save thee. Isn't that beautiful? Knowest thou the condescension of God? Lewis Smead said, Waiting is our destiny. As creatures who cannot by themselves bring about what they hope for, we wait in darkness for a flame we cannot light. We wait in fear for a happy ending we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. Sometimes it definitely feels like that, doesn't it? Joseph Worthlin had a speech called Sunday Will Come, and I wanted to quote a little bit from this. I think of how dark that Friday was when Christ was lifted up on the cross. On that terrible Friday, the earth shook and grew dark. Frightful storms lashed at the earth. Those evil men who sought his life rejoiced. Now that Jesus was no more, surely those who followed him would disperse. On that day, they stood triumphant. On that day, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were both overcome with grief and despair. The superb man they had loved and honored hung lifeless upon the cross. On that Friday, the apostles were devastated. Jesus, their Savior, the man who had walked on water and raised the dead, was himself at the mercy of wicked men. They watched helplessly as he was overcome by his enemies. On that Friday, the Savior of mankind was humiliated and bruised, abused, and reviled. It was a Friday filled with devastating, consuming sorrow that gnawed at the souls of those who loved and honored the Son of God. I think that of all the days since the beginning of this world's history, that Friday was the darkest. There's a great quote from Rocky Balboa. I know, my friends, it's Rocky again. We just can't get away from him. If you want grit, we're going to go to Rocky. And in the film Rocky Balboa, he has this confrontation with his son who's saying he has this great life, but he kind of has this chip on his shoulder about his dad because he's Rocky's kid. And Rocky has this beautiful speech. I wouldn't even say 
speech, it just pours out of him in this moment. And he said, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It is a very mean and nasty place and it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hit and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you are because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that. And that ain't you. You're better than that. Going one more round when you don't think you can, that's what makes all the difference in your life. The fourth watch is about finding a way to go one more round. And that's one of the many reasons Mary Magdalene is my hero. She took that final round and she waited in the dark alone when no one else was there to wait with her. There she was. Because she knew she needed to be there. She believed she had hope. And the fourth watch and the night can be a wonderful reminder of the fact that the sun I was going to be cheesy and quote Annie, the sun will come out tomorrow. (laughs) But it will. The sun and our world was set up to remind us of both of those things. Our good poet friend Rilke said, I have faith in nights. Such a delicious line. The nights are what bring the glow and the dawning of a new day of the sun And the sun, of course, is such a beautiful symbol of the Son of God rising again. If you go back to Joseph Worthland's talk, the doom of that day did not endure. The despair did not linger because on Sunday, the resurrected Lord burst the bonds of death. He ascended from the grave and appeared gloriously triumphant as the Savior of all mankind. I would add, of the cosmos. And in an instant, the eyes that had been filled with ever-flowing tears dried. The lips that had whispered prayers of distress and grief now filled the air with wondrous praise. For Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, stood before them as the first fruits of the resurrection, the proof that death is merely the beginning of a new and wondrous existence. Each of us will have our own Fridays. Those days when the universe seems itself shattered and the shards of our world lie littered about us in pieces. We all will experience those broken times when it seems we can never be put together again. We will all have our Fridays. But I testify to you in the name of the one who conquered death, Sunday will come. In the darkness of our sorrow, Sunday will come. No matter our desperation, no matter our grief, Sunday will come. In this life or the next, Sunday will come. And I love that the word for Sunday in Russian is Voskresenia, which means resurrection. And our word for Sunday means the day of the sun. And so when the sun rose on that day, everything changed. The landscape of the cosmos changed. And Sunday will come, my friends. And it's usually in the fourth watch that the Savior shows up. And illumination and relief and joy come too. So how do we do this? I love the Greek word for resurrection. It's anastasis. It's where you get the Russian name Anastasia, by the way. Spray your Windex bottles. Yes, there it is. But it literally means to rise up, to stand up, to be reborn, to go higher. One of the definitions 
from the Thayer's Greek lexicon is a raising or a rising from a seat, like a stone which some will lay hold of in order to climb, but others will strike against it and fall. Isn't that interesting that you can look at that as a place to go forward or a place that would stop you from going forward? I believe the choice is up to you. And of course, the rising from the dead, that of Christ. Although it has come to pass as yet only in the case of Christ alone. But the invitation is there to rise, my friends. As Rocky said, to get up one more time, to stay in the ring, to have faith in the nights, to sit with the darkness, knowing that the sun will rise. And I mean that in every sense of the word. Because he rose, you can also rise. He said to get up one more time, to stay in the ring, to have faith in the nights, to sit with the darkness, knowing that the sun will rise. And I mean that in every sense of the word. Because he rose, you can also rise. Even in small victories, even in staying in the game, even in finding a way to just last out that last watch of the night. I love that when he heals paralytics and people who have been maimed and blind, the injunction is always to rise. It's always to be more than you were. It's always to embrace life with new perspective and new joy and new life. When he gives them life and health, I believe they're infused with spiritual power, dynamis. This power that comes from virtue, and virtue is strength from doing right. So the injunction to stand up and take your bed or to rise and take on new life where you were blind or you were crippled or you couldn't hear, that's the invitation that you would also rise, that you would raise up, that you would go higher, that because of him you would have new eyes that would see and ears that can hear and you're able to walk a higher, holier walk because of his walk. His life is called zoe in Greek, and that means the ability to beget life. Not just bios, which is biology, but this eternal livelihood, this infusion of eternal life. I love the priestly blessing found in Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. And again, keep means to guard, preserve. Set up a watch around. May Yahweh make his face to light up upon you, to shine. That's really a great word right there. It means to give light to. But it it's also used in... When God speaks and there's light, it's so many beautiful levels of that. So may his face shine or give light upon you and be gracious to you, give favor to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I hope perhaps on Easter morning or any morning or every morning that when you see that glorious fiery orb, rising in the east, you will know that that is a symbol of the Son of God. You will know that that's a symbol that death and darkness and sin and despair and grief and all those things that weigh you down are not built to last. They've all been overcome And Sunday will come. It will come again and again 
and again, and the invitation is to rise, take up your bed, and walk. The great French writer Alexandre Dumas said, All human wisdom is summed up in two words, wait and hope. The hope is all about the resurrection that's offered to you and I. And I hope as you sit in the fourth watch of this world or your situation or whatever it is in this dark night called mortality, that you'll take some extra time this Easter weekend to look at that fiery orb in the sky and know that the darkness is never meant to say that it will always be chased away by the sun and the Lord will bless you and keep you. And he will make the light of his countenance to shine upon you and give you grace. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. May love and light be yours. Thank you for joining us. We hope this episode lit a spark inside of you. For show notes and other information, please visit our website, reflectinglight.org. And if you feel this program illuminated your mind or heart, consider making a donation to fund further episodes. Until next time.